Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this, and as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host. This is actually episode 58, I think it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I am your host. My name is Larry Erickson. Um, and uh, for the next eh, almost half hour, I'm going to be ranting at you and telling you stories, a ranter and raconteur, um, talking about things that are important to me, I think deserve your attention. Uh, if you actually wind up having any comments, questions, reactions, plaudits, brickbats, whatever, uh, you can send them to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, if you didn't catch that, which you probably didn't, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, well, the web address will be up here a couple of times, somewhere around there during the show, and um, you can go there and get the email address from there. I do answer my email. Sometimes a little slow about it, but I do answer it. I just do request, however, that if you um, do email me, that in the subject line you include something like your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that so that um, I know it's not spam. All right, well, i got a couple of things I want to get to today. Uh, The first is I have to go back to something I talked about last week. I I talked about the... um, about arguments uh, about, that have been raised about the 14th Amendment and about um, uh, restricting its definition of who was a citizen. Uh, this was specifically, the, the idea was, this was uh, about immigration. So the 14th Amendment says if you're born here and subject to the laws here, you're a citizen here. Well, they, people were talking about changing that, so being born here didn't necessarily mean you were a citizen. Uh, I said we haven't heard much about these 14th Amendment arguments, and and in fact, we haven't for a year or two. But I was a little bit wrong about saying we hadn't heard anything about the 14th Amendment. It turns out we have been hearing something more recently about the 14th Amendment, just from a different perspective. Uh, Instead of people wanting to restrict the 14th Amendment to not include some people born here, some people want to expand the 14th Amendment to include people who they call the unborn, people who aren't even born yet. This obviously is a thing to try to ban abortion. And by the way, I'm going to mention it here. I always like to mention this every time this comes up. There is no such thing as an unborn child. Referring to a fetus as an unborn child makes exactly as much sense as referring to a tadpole as an unborn frog. If it's not born, it's not a child. But, leaving that aside for the moment... um, One of the things that happened is that last fall, Republican, then Republican presidential candidate, Representative Michelle Bonkersman, um, she told a a, a Gopper presidential forum that she would rely on the provision of the 14th Amendment that allows Congress to uh, enforce the equal protection under the laws provision of the 14th Amendment, and that using that, she would support a bill that would overturn Roe v. Wade simply by declaring a fetus to be a person under the meaning of the amendment. Just recently, in a fundraising letter uh, dated uh, May 14th, just, you know, just recently, uh, Senator Rancid Paul proposed a Life at Conception Act, which would do what Bonkers Man said she wanted to do to find fetuses as persons under the 14th Amendment. Now, this is, you probably will not be surprised to learn, complete and utter nonsense. Congress cannot simply decide what the 14th Amendment means. Interpretation of that sort is the job of the courts, not the legislatures. And the thing is, the Roe decision itself said, I'm quoting here, the word person as used in the 14th Amendment does not include the unborn. This has already been decided at the Supreme Court. But simple facts don't stop these people any more than they do in the cases of like evolution and global warming. It's another example of what I mentioned last week, that, that uh, right-wing reading comprehension disorder, where they refuse to recognize the meaning of the words directly in front of them. And by the way, as a footnote to this, Uh, I have to say that credit where it's due, I said last week I got that phrase from a blog that I read. The guy's name is Kevin T. Keith, and the blog is leanleft.com. And lean left, just the way it sounds, one word. All right, moving on from there. Since I already happened to mention global warming, uh, then I'm going to do something about global warming. 
Now, the last 12 months, that is the period uh, May 2011 to April 2012, were the hottest 12 months in U.S. history, the hottest 12-month period in U.S. history, and that's since record-keeping began in 1895. That is according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, according to their National Climatic Data Center. In fact, what's interesting is that all 10 of the 10 hottest 12-month periods have occurred in the last 12 years. Now, to be, to be fair and to be precise, these are not years. These are 12-month periods, so they can overlap. But still, the 10 hottest 12-month periods on record have all occurred in the last 12 years. April was the fifth warmest April on record worldwide. It was the third warmest on record in the United States. Its average temperature was nearly 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 7 tenths of a, of a degree Celsius, above the 20th century normal. That is the average over the entire 20th century for the month of April. In fact, the last time the planet Earth had a month which averaged below its 20th century normal was in February of 1985. April makes it 326 months in a row where the temperature has been above the average for the 20th century for that month. Nearly half the population of the world has never experienced a month cooler than the average for the 20th century for that month. But we don't need to worry about this. Don't need to worry about this at all. One commenter on one of these things actually said that we only need to be able to see past the data to know that the world is actually cooling. We only need to get past all those facts that you've accumulated to understand the world's actually cooling. Now that person was being sarcastic. That person was being sarcastic. But the attitude that it captures is quite real. Just last month, for example, Pat Robertson, that well-known climatologist, Pat Robertson, claimed that global warming is a hoax and that people cannot possibly be having an effect on the climate because, after all, there are no SUVs on Mars. What this is, is that uh, astronomers have detected, they think, a slight warming trend on Mars, and the nanny nanny naysayers on global warming have latched onto this as proof that the whole thing's nonsense. The trouble is, the measured output in solar radiance compared from one decade to another, is on the order of a fraction of 1%. In the Earth, in, the, in our climate, in the Earth's, with our atmosphere, it's not even enough to really get a detectable signal. This is just utter and complete nonsense. The fact is, no model of the climate can explain the uh, warming we've seen in the last couple of decades if that model does not include a significant result from the effects of human activity. There is no model that can explain the warming without us. All right, moving on from there. This is going to be the first, I think it's the first example of what might prove to be an occasional series called The Little Thing. You see, sometimes uh, in looking at a story or an issue or an article or something, it's not the thing that everybody's talking about that gets me. It's not the thing that everybody's looking at that really gripes me. It'll be some little thing, some minor point, some aside, some casual mention of something that will really get to me. So here's an example of that. Now, you know about, at least I assume you know about, the vote uh, on May 17th, where the House of Representatives rejected an amendment that would have put a quick end to the war in Afghanistan by saying funds for that war could only be used for the safe and orderly withdrawal of U.S. troops and military contractors. The vote, in fact, wasn't even close. It was 303 to 113 rejected this amendment. The thing is, the people who voted against this amendment did it despite acknowledging the fact that Americans are really tired of this pointless war and that the war in Afghanistan is now as unpopular as Vietnam was in the early 1970s. Americans now reject the war in Afghanistan by a margin of better than two to one. Now, to what 
should be no one's surprise, that fact didn't make any difference to the members of Congress. Um, now, the truth is, I was not surprised uh, by the outcome, or in fact, even by the margin. The, um, the first moves to actually legislatively put an end to the Indochina War didn't come until 1970. That was the McGovern-Hatfield Amendment. And in fact, it wasn't until after the Paris Peace Accords were signed in 1973 that Congress actually cut off funds for U.S. combat role in Southeast Asia. So I wasn't surprised by the result because now, as then, in the words of Representative Barbara Lee, the people are far ahead of Congress. So that was the thing that got me. No, that was in it. It, was, it. This was it. This was it. This is quoting from the article. Opponents of the amendment conceded that the public has grown tired of the war, but they argued against a precipitous withdrawal. And I read that, and I was like, ah, <clears throat> precipitous withdrawal? What decade is this? She's talking about your 60s flashbacks. Precipitous withdrawal, that was exactly, and I mean those words were the argument used against getting out of Indochina back in the late 60s and early 70s. That is uh, when it wasn't called cutting and running. And we who opposed the war were not being called nervous Nellies or uh, an effete core of impudent snobs or nattering nabobs of negativism. Good times. Uh, precipitous withdrawal. You know what that means? That means getting out of a stupid, pointless, cruel, bloody, uh, destructive, mindless war any sooner than the militarists had already decided they would get out of it. Because if they were to do that, that would mean admitting how badly they screwed it up in the first place, and we just can't have that. The public desires be damned. I mean, it just, you know, it's what we heard then, it's what we heard now. It's what we hear every single time that the people suss out just how lame our misleaders are when it comes to the issue of shedding our blood. Precipitous withdrawal. Yeah, when you hear that, you know one thing. They intend for us to continue to kill and die, and they don't have one damn good reason for it. Okay, on from there to what is our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Everything you need to know. I'm doing, I got my whole script backwards here. We're actually doing everything you need to know. Um, and this is our occasional feature where uh, you can learn a lot about something in just a couple of sentences. Just a couple of sentences. In this case, it's everything you need to know about corporate influence on the media in just three sentences. One, on Sunday, May 20th, the Boston Globe carried a front page article about the efforts of Partners Healthcare Incorporated to lobby against a proposed bill for closer oversight of the prices and operations of hospitals and their associated medical groups like Physicians Healthcare, like uh, Partners Healthcare. Two, in the fourth paragraph of the story, still on the front page, the Globe said this, quoting, the Harvard-affiliated partners has led the lobbying charge among hospitals, deeply worried that the House legislation and other bills could harm their ability to provide high-quality care and cost jobs. Three, which means that the Boston Globe has just published as unquestioned fact the corporate propaganda that their real interest, what they're really worried about, is high-quality care and jobs instead of their bottom line. And that is everything you need to know. And we're going to take a break. And we're back. And guess what? We're doing the outrage of the week. For real this time. It actually is this time. We're going to be talking about uh, Jeffrey Lacker. He is the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Uh, part of the Federal Reserve System, and he says he knows exactly what the problem with our economy is, or specifically what the problem with unemployment is and why unemployment is so high. It has nothing to do with a lack of stimulus, he says, nothing to do with corporations sitting on $2 trillion in cash and not doing anything with it. Uh, it has nothing to do with lack of demand. 
No, no, no. The biggest reason for this, he says, is labor market inefficiencies, such as the difficulty of matching workers with skilled jobs. Now, this actually means two things. One, it means that it's again about job training. This is the same bumper sticker that's been plastered all over this issue for the last 40 years or more. Um, and in fact, what it really does is it makes the inadequacies of the workers' skills the problem. It's the workers' fault. And also, this then, of necessity, this lack of match, refers to the reluctance of workers to simply just move where the jobs are without being concerned like silly things like having a stable life. That, he claims, could account for much as 5.9 percentage points of the, of the 8.1% unemployment. So without these inefficiencies, the unemployment rate, it's only 2.2%. That's incredible. But wait a minute. There's more. You know what the other big thing is? Unemployment compensation. If it wasn't for unemployment compensation, if it wasn't for letting all those lazy slobs loll around without working, why the unemployment rate would drop another 1.7 percentage points. So in other words, what part of unemployment is not due to the shortcomings of workers? One half of 1%. That's the part that has anything to do with business or the banks. Now, Lacker actually might have a little more trouble with the fact that while the official unemployment rate is 8.1%, a broader measure, which includes discouraged workers, is at 14.5%. The employed as a portion of the population in April dropped to an, to an historically low level of 58.4%. Long-term unemployed are down to only 5.1 million people because People are losing their unemployment. They're using up their benefits and so dropping off the rolls. And part-timers who want full-time work, their numbers are up in April to nearly 8 million. Meanwhile, half of all American families survive on incomes no more than two times the poverty line. In a ranking of 34 countries with modern economies done by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the United States ranks fourth in income inequality, or if you prefer, 31st in income equality. Only Chile, Mexico, and Turkey are worse. But, according to the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, has nothing to do with this, no problems. The real problem is lazy, uneducated workers who dare to want to set down roots. Fortunately for us, this guy is not the only voice in the Federal Reserve System, and there are some people in there who are more rational. But Jeffrey Lacker, who is well-named as he seems to lack a lot of things, such as compassion, understanding, and some vague connection to the actual world in which most of us live, Jeffrey Lacker is the outrage of the week. All right, moving on now to the last thing for this week. And this, again, refers back to something I said last week. Last week in, 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 my, in, my, in my long rant about the loss of the commons, um, I, I said that among the things that there was an attack on political participation and on, on our ability to take part in the political life of the nation, an attack that went beyond things like the new restrictions on voting and the ever-increasing power of money. And I said I'd discuss. I'd point out some examples of these other restrictions uh, this week, so that's what I'm going to spend these last minutes doing. I mean, for one thing, uh, our Fourth Amendment is under attack. Here's just a, a couple of recent examples. I like this one. In the summer of 2010, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates said that they imposed a ban on blackberries on the grounds that they didn't have the ability to monitor the communications over blackberries. Um, that is, citizens could actually have conversations without the government being able to listen in, and they just simply could not allow that. Now, the Obama administration condemned that ban. They called it a dangerous precedent and a threat to democracy, human rights, and freedom of information. Six weeks later, the Obama administration proposed a bill that would have a mandatory backdoor access for the government for all forms of internet communication. That is, the government wanted to require not only that they could monitor your communications, but that the companies would be required to make it easy for the government to do so. Now, they haven't gotten this yet, but they're still fighting for it. Just a couple of weeks ago, CNET 
reported that the FBI is lobbying internet companies to not oppose this kind of proposal. Now, th there's this, it's this guy, he's a columnist and a, and a blogger, but his name is Glenn Greenwald. Uh, he said, I'm quoting him here, the hallmark of a surveillance state is that police agencies secretly monitor and keep dossiers, not only on those individuals suspected of lawbreaking, but on the society generally, including those individuals about whom there is no suspicion of wrongdoing. And that's exactly what, we're, what the government is seeking to engage in now. And it's also happening on a more local level. The New York Police Department, often in cooperation with the CIA, has engaged in a massive spying campaign aimed at Muslims, uh, Muslim people, students, institutions, and mosques, some of them hundreds and hundreds of miles from the borders of New York City. And all these people are being, uh, institutions are being watched without any suggestion that they've done anything wrong. Our freedom of the press is under attack. Last Friday, uh, May 18th was the date, the Obama administration was before the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals to insist that New York Times reporter James Risen be forced to testify in the trial of a former CIA agent named Jeffrey Sterling, who was accused of leaking uh, classified information to Risen about a botched uh, um, uh, uh, plot against the government of Iran. Now, the district court had ruled that Risen had a qualified privilege not to testify, saying, quoting the ruling, a criminal trial subpoena is not a free pass for the government to rifle through a reporter's notebook. In looking to overturn that, the government has argued that there is no such thing as reporter's privilege, that the idea that there has to be a balancing act between uh, the freedom of the press and the public's right to know and some need for government secrecy that is entirely for the executive branch to decide. This is all part and parcel of the Obama administration's attacks on freedom of the press. This, these attacks have included a record number of prosecution of whistleblowers, many of who have been charged under the Espionage Act from 1917. In fact, they've charged more people under the Espionage Act than all prior presidents combined. A consensus has emerged and is emerging among civil rights people and among uh, uh, free speech organizations about the government, uh, about, the, uh, about the administration of Barack Obama. It is increasingly regarded as the worst on issues related to freedom of information and transparency. And by the way, there's also a different sort of attack, if you will, on freedom of the press and our ability to know things. An amendment that would legalize the use of government propaganda on American audiences is being inserted, apparently, into the latest defense authorization bill without debate, without hearings, without discussion. The amendment, you see, there's a ban right now. The, the kind of stuff that the State Department and the military and the Pentagon put out overseas as propaganda on, on behalf of the United States or to favor the United States, they can't release that stuff domestically. This bill would eliminate that ban and allow the government to propagandize us the same way it tries to propagandize everybody else. Meanwhile, there, an attack on both freedom of the press and freedom of assembly, dozens, if not hundreds, of, of journalists and Occupy protesters have been arrested for the supposed crime of trying to record events as they happen, including recording police on public streets. Nine free speech groups have appealed to the Department of Justice to protect the rights of the media and protesters, saying, quote, the First Amendment has come under assault on the streets of America, unquote. However, they shouldn't probably expect much of a response. Some weeks ago, a new trove of heavily redacted documents pried out of the Department for the Protection of the Fatherland by a Freedom of Information uh, request makes it evident that th there was and is a nationally coordinated campaign to undermine and ultimately crush the Occupy movement. Blacked out and limited and redacted though they are, these, docs, uh, these documents offer clues to the extent of government's concern about and involvement in um, uh, dealing with the occupations that swept across the country after Occupy Wall Street. The latest documents reveal intense involvement by the Department of Homeland Security's so-called National Operations Center, 
which actually is the agency's primary conduit to the White House Situation Room and also facilitates information sharing with other federal, state, local, tribal, non-governmental operations centers and the private sector. Now in mid-November, back in mid-November, I raised the possibility that um, various attacks by cities on, the, on Occupy encampments had been coordinated I said this because both the tactics employed and the excuses employed were so similar. The excuses almost always revolved around unsanitary and unsafe conditions in the camps. So I found it particularly interesting that amid, in the middle of these documents, among these documents, there is a November 21st reference to how to handle situation if, quote, a protest area is on federal property and has been deemed unsafe or unsanitary by the General Services Administration or city officials. And finally, we have, for now, the weaponization of police. Riot gear seems to be normal street wear for cops now, and armored vehicles are replacing squad cars. There's an outfit called the LRAD Corporation, which has developed a device called the LRAD. It stands for Long Range Acoustic Hailing Device. This thing can generate recorded sounds. It actually has an MP3 player built into it. Uh, it can generate recorded, recorded sounds or produce a screeching siren, all at tremendous intensities of 137 to 162 decibels. To give you an idea of how loud that is, 130 decibels is threshold of pain. The company insists that this is just to help police provide clear instructions to protesters from long distances. We really don't think this is any kind of weapon, they say. Yet, right, like the instructions are not going to, inc not going to consist of uh, stop protesting and leave now. This is especially because this device, or something similar to it, has already been used on Occupy protesters in Oakland, California. Finally, we have the attack on dissent by, the, by simple police corruption. Last week, I talked about how, how cops get away with lying on the stand. Well, the New York Police Department has arrested thousands of protesters since Occupy Wall Street began in September. But the first actual trial just ended uh, uh, um, last week with an acquittal. Guy's name is Alexander Arbuckle. He arrested back on January 1st with a bunch of others marching down 13th Street in Lower Manhattan. The NYPD charged those with disorderly conduct. They claimed they were in the street blocking traffic. That's what the police report said. That's what the cop testified to in, under oath. The problem was the photographs and video taken that night, including by the cop's own video unit, show that the protesters were on the sidewalk and the cops were the ones in the street, including on foot and their scooters going the wrong way down the one-way street. The cops lied through their teeth. Fortunately, this time, there was proof. Our rights, our abilities to take part are under attack, and don't you forget it. We're done. We're out of here. Um, that's going to be it for me for this week. Uh, you just have the best week you can. Don't forget our open house, June 16th, noon to 6, and um, you come back next week because I'll be here too. Have a good week.